So, if you really think about it, the American sitcom is a lot like a haiku. Limited structure, you have to follow a formula to a T, it's short, it's simple, and in their own special way they play with our emotions, whether it be tears or laughter. And one of the greatest poets of the sitcom is Mr. Tim Allen excelling in gut-busting one-liners and bone-breaking shenanigans that I like to call blue-collar postmodern slapstick. This man was able to capture, sum up, and interpret everything society was feeling with just a beautiful grunt. Ah, it's beautiful, yeah. Ah, ah. <laughs> <laughs> But over the years and after a couple of box office bombs, it seems like that grunt has faded. The grunt has taken on a new meaning to some. A grunt that once brought us all together now seems to have divided a nation. I'm not kidding. You gotta be real careful around here. You know, you get beat up. If you don't believe what everybody believes, this is like 30s Germany. I don't know what, I don't know what happened. That's Tim Taylor, care of Drew Time, P.O. Box 3273. Al? Yet, with reruns on the tele and spin off sequels to almost all of his classics, we are constantly reminded how funny this man really is. So, this Christmas season, as we get ready to watch Scott Calvin put on the coat and become jolly old Saint Nick for almost 30 years in a row, we ask that ever-important question. What the f*** happened to Tim Allen? <laughs> but to truly understand what the f*** happened to Tim Allen, we must begin at the beginning and the beginning began when he was born on his birthday. 1953, Denver, Colorado. Tragically, at the age of 11, young Tim Allen lost his father, who was killed by a drunk driver. Allen would move to Michigan with his mother and stepfather, where he would spend his formative years getting into a little bit of mischief. Tim Allen developed a crippling addiction to alcohol at a very young age, and in order to pay for his alcohol, young Tim Allen would resort to selling drugs. The illegal kind! Yeah, he quickly became far more than just a juvenile delinquent. On October 2nd, 1978, Allen was arrested at a Michigan airport with one and a half pounds of that horribly sweet, horrible nose candy that the experts like to call cocaine. Here's a PSA from Joe Blow real quick. Don't do that, the cocaine stuff. Just don't, don't even, don't do it. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, Santa Claus was once on the naughty list, and he was playing with a different kind of snow. The person that Tim Allen was selling all that cocaine to just happened to be an undercover cop. Huh? These guys, I got a lot of work to do. This is a big mistake, really. You gotta watch the suit, too. This is so old. It's an antique, you know. Tim Allen was facing the possibility of life in prison but he ended up serving just two years and four months. Tim Allen said that after his release from prison, it humbled him due to the humiliation of everything and helped him refocus his life to setting and achieving goals. And it was Tim's ability to make everyone and anyone laugh that helped him stay alive in prison. Homeboy was fresh meat, if you know what I'm saying, and a couple of guys who were up to no good started making trouble for this future superstar. But before the beatdown could begin, young Timmy Boy used the only weapon he had. Comedy. Drug trafficking inmate Tim Allen started joking around and basically earned the respect of the other inmates with his stand-up routines. The other prisoners were like, if we shank him, he'll stop making us laugh, so I guess we should probably not shank him. But yeah, after a bit of information sharing with the authorities, the tool man was a free man. And for the most part, Mr. Allen has stayed on the straight and narrow, with the notable exception of his 1998 arrest for driving under the influence. 
which netted him one year of probation, and he was sent to an alcohol abuse clinic. Drunk driving, what the f***, Tim? But good news for us Tim Allen fans. As of now, he is currently 21 years clean and sober, something that he recently talked about and is incredibly proud of. And we're proud of you too, Timmy boy. Cue that sitcom applause. So, now that we know a little bit about this man's dark and troubled past, let's learn about the work he has done since refocusing his life. He would start to gain a bit of notoriety around the Detroit comedy scene with his man's man routine. So here's the thing with the comedy stylings of Tim Allen. He often gets criticized for telling the same joke over and over. You know the joke that men are men and men like to do manly things, and women hate it and then he grunts. <laughs> it's kind of the perfect joke. There's nothing wrong with telling the same type of joke over and over and over again, if that joke makes people laugh. And yeah, it still makes us laugh. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, he does have more range than that, but he found his thang and it worked. And he frickin' ran with it all the way to Hollywood. Tim Allen would eventually become a regular performer at the famed Comedy Store in Los Angeles. And at that time, stand-up comedians were really starting to make a name for themselves in the acting world. But Tim Allen said that he knew he had such a limited range as an actor that he could really only play a character that was similar to himself. So it's no surprise that the only real credit before becoming a sitcom legend was as a baggage handler in the film Tropical Snow, which is a movie about cocaine smuggling. Tropical Snow. But the reason we all know and love Tim Allen is because from 1991 to 1999, he would play the lead character, Tim the Toolman Taylor, in 204 episodes of one of the greatest television shows ever made, Home Improvement. Huh? Where he got to tell his same hilarious jokes over and over for eight seasons. Just like with stand-up comedian Jerry Seinfeld, and others, these Hollywood fat cats made a sitcom based off of his stand-up comedy material. But Tim Allen was more of a working man, Seinfeld? For most of the 90s, Tim Allen would make a lot of gorilla cavemen grunting noises. You know how they go. <laughs> and all of these hilarious home improvement hijinks never failed to make the top 10 in viewership. Ratings. It had a lot of them. I actually am doing some home improvement binge watching right now. And I noticed that at least in the first season, Home Improvement follows a very particular narrative formula. Always the same story beats. The episodes usually open with Tim having a problem with either his troublemaking boys or his horrible, nagging wife. She is just the worst. Tim then goes to work on his Tool Time TV show, where he talks about tools while bullying his assistant, Al, while he's always incorporating his life home problems into the show. And then he usually injures himself or breaks something. A troubled Tim then returns home to listen to the wisdom of his faceless neighbor, Wilson. Then Tim drags himself back to his horrible wife, she's just the worst, and tells her everything was his fault and that she's always right. Even though she's not, she's the worst. And we get a blooper reel as the credits roll. And you know what? The formula, it works! <laughs> this show is a favorite of many people because it still gives us a genuine gut-level laugh. Tim Allen's character, Tim Taylor, is a bit of a buffoon, but in the hands of a lesser comedian slash actor, his buffoonery could have been played up to the point of absurdity, but it's not, it's still relatable. Just the right amount of blue-collar postmodern slapstick. 
But no matter what, usually his character's heart is in the right place. But not his wife, she's horrible. This show, Home Improvement, was so popular that when it was announced it was going to end after eight seasons, the studio offered Tim Allen $50 million to do a ninth season, but he declined. This show would rack up nominations over the years, with nine Golden Globe nominations, including one win for Tim Allen as lead actor, 12 People's Choice Award wins, including eight for Tim Allen, and seven Emmy Award nominations, but no wins. And you know what, whenever anyone questions Tim Allen's acting ability, I always point them to season two, episode nine, where Tim has to hold back tears. And it's actually impressively heartbreaking. And it shows us why things like cars and other manly things are so important to Tim. He's not just a dumb goofball. The tool man has layers, at least in one scene. I miss my dad an awful lot, honey. But if sitcom immortality wasn't enough, Tim Allen would take his talents to the big screen to portray one of the most iconic characters ever. He would star in the 1994 Christmas classic, The Santa Claus. Tim Allen was cast after both Chevy Chase and Bill Murray turned down the role. Of course, this film, The Santa Claus, would go on to make nearly $200 million off a $22 million budget, and would soon be considered a Christmas classic, while also picking up the People's Choice Award for Favorite Comedy Film. Sadly, this franchise is the very definition of the law of diminishing returns. The film's first sequel, The Santa Claus 2, just lacked the charm of the original, but it still made a lot of money. And hotshot reporter Kelly Clarkson got the exclusive from Tim Allen to find out that behind the scenes, jolly old Saint Nick infamously said a bad word that starts with F after a few children were ruining all the takes. And everybody knows that the number one rule of Christmas is that you can't say f while you're dressed as Santa Claus. And then came the Santa Claus 3, the escape clause, and it was uh, not good at all. Just a big jolly mess of a movie. But of course, all of these movies were getting a little stale with audiences. And I think it was Family Guy that said it best when they joked about Disney punishing children by putting them in Tim Allen Christmas movies. Now sing! I shall do no such thing! You must sing! If you don't, so I'll make you do a Christmas movie with Tim Allen! It's a tiny, tiny world! 1995 would see Tim Allen take on yet another now classic character when he voiced everybody's favorite space ranger, Buzz Lightyear. In the first ever all CGI feature length film, Toy Story. As you know, this film would be a game changer, ushering in the modern age of computer animation, for better or worse. And with many 90s kids, this film, Toy Story, probably still ranks as one of their favorite films of all time. Deservingly so. The story, the performances, they're all magnificent, and Tim Allen, he's perfect. There was just something about seeing your toys come to life that's just so magical. Of course, the film Toy Story would be a massive hit, spawning three sequels, like Toy Story 2, which made Tim Allen cry. And there was Toy Story 3, where we got to hear an evil buzz. And there was Toy Story 4, which I don't think he really had much to do in that one. He's in it, though. But it was still nice to see and hear him as Buzz. Yes, hearing Tim Allen's voice as Buzz is nice. Hint, hint, light year. To infinity and beyond! But yeah, if Santa Claus and Buzz Lightyear isn't enough for you, if it didn't give you the Tim Allen fix you desire, you should check out some of these Tim Allen movies that I'm about to talk about. He actually did some decent comedies in 1997, such as Jungle to Jungle and For Richer or Poorer, which, like I said, were both released in 1997. 
Jungle to Jungle is the Disney remake of a foreign film called Little Indian Big City. And I remember enjoying seeing Tim Allen deal with these Tarzan-like fatherly antics while he and Martin Short fight the Mafia, I think? And the hilarious comedy for Richer or Poorer teams Timmy up with the late, great Kirstie Alley. And they have wonderful chemistry in this Amish comedy. It's like Witness, but funnier. Tim Allen was also in something called Who is Cletus Tout in 2001. In that same year of 2001, he was in a movie called Joe Somebody. I actually once met a man who told me that he got into screenwriting because he was an extra on Joe Somebody, and he thought, wow, this is horrible, and this actually got made. I can do better than this. And then this man went on to pursue a career in screenwriting. I don't know if anything ever happened. I don't know if he actually became a Joe Somebody. So yeah, this movie, it's so bad, it will inspire you to make better movies, I guess. Everybody should not watch the horribly unfunny embarrassment that is The Shaggy Dog, where Tim Allen turns into a shaggy dog. Yeah, it's a remake of that Disney classic. Tim Allen just does dog things, and he's like, look at me, I'm, I'm being funny because I'm not a dog. I'm a human, and I'm doing dog things. Comedy, no. And in that same year of 2006, he was in a horrible embarrassment that is Zoom. It's a stupid superhero movie for kids. Tim Allen was also a part of a pretty dang funny ensemble cast in a biker comedy that's actually better than it needs to be, Wild Hogs in 2007. He was then in something called The Six Wives of Henry Le Fay? And then he would step outside his comfort zone in the David Mamet-directed Red Belt, showing us that Tim Allen can handle drama too, especially in the hands of a talented filmmaker like David Mamet. I'd like to see Tim Allen try more of this stuff, actually. Just wanna have a drink. <laughs> then Mr. Allen stepped behind the camera for the 2010 comedy Crazy on the Outside, which earned 8% on those tomatoes that are rotten.com, and this made a whopping $88,000 at the box office. And I guess the only thing that's slightly interesting about this motion picture directed by Tim Allen is that the character in the movie seems to have something in common with Tim Allen, having spent a few years in prison and is now looking to rebuild his life. Semi-autobiographical. After three years in prison, Tommy Zelda couldn't wait to get home. But wait, mixed into the filmography, of Tim Allen are actually some truly genuine gems of cinema. First and foremost is the hilarious sci-fi Star Trek fandom parody, satire, Galaxy Quest in 1999. One of the best years for movies ever and Galaxy Quest is one of the reasons why 1999 rocked at the movies. He is cast freaking perfectly in this. One reason is because he always plays the reluctant hero so damn well. And we all know that he's basically playing William Shatner, but it never becomes a one-dimensional caricature or a silly impersonation. Tim makes the role his own, which elevates the jokes all the way to space, the outer space. Tim Allen is great at portraying the guy who doesn't want to be bothered with you or your issues, yet he secretly yearns for that attention. Maybe Tim Allen could relate to this fallen TV star. I don't know. With a $45 million budget, the film was able to double it, but the respect and admiration of this film Galaxy Quest has only grown over the years as it has become a true cult classic, and the cult is pretty damn big. Are you in the cult? And Galaxy Quest became a cult classic because it is so witty and so clever, 
it makes fun of things like Star Trek, but you can also tell that the filmmakers are huge fans and respect the material. Everybody is great in this film. They play off of each other well. The chemistry, the comedic timing, and even the character design and the set design, it's beautiful to look at. Everybody says they want a Galaxy Quest sequel or a TV show or something, but let's not ruin the magic, you guys. The next piece of classic Tim Allen is one that not very many people remember or know about, but for my money, it deserves a lot of respect. It's a film called Big Trouble, and it is truly a great comedy. It feels like a movie the Coen brothers should have made, if you know what I'm saying, and has an amazing ensemble cast. But yeah, you know, if you like funny movies, watch this one. Tim Allen's in it, and he's good too. Like a lot of us, Tim Allen must really love Christmas, because in addition to working on the Santa Claus franchise, he's also appeared in other Christmas movies. In 2004 came the film Christmas with the Cranks, which is based off of a John Grisham novel called Skipping Christmas. Yeah, the guy who wrote The Rainmaker, A Time to Kill, The Client, and The Firm, he also wrote a book that the Christmas with the Cranks is based on. And what's even funnier about that is that Tim Allen had no interest in doing another Christmas movie, but he signed on to do this one just because of the fact that it was based on a John Grisham novel and he thought it was gonna be like, you know, a John Grisham novel. And some people like this movie, but it was not a success. And you know what? I actually don't like this movie at all. I really tried to like it. It has a great cast but the characters are so annoying and aggressive about Christmas that this Christmas movie almost makes me not like Christmas. And I really like Christmas, so I blame John Grisham for this crime. Tim Allen's next Yuletide romp would be in the 2017 Netflix movie El Camino Christmas. And yeah, this one isn't going to be considered a classic anytime soon, but it has another solid cast involved, and Tim Allen is a part of that cast. I really love the tagline for El Camino Christmas, though. It reads, Bullets, beer, holiday cheer. And then there was Light Year in 2022, which saw Chris Evans voicing the iconic character. Which, uh, yeah, I, I, I kind of get it. Light Year was the movie Andy Saul or something that made him fall in love with the character or the real guy that the movie was based off of that they made a toy about that Andy likes. Uh, I don't know. So then how come the toy doesn't sound like Chris Evans then? If it, should, it should sound like Tim Allen, right? I don't know. There are many reasons why some people think that Light Year became one of the biggest bombs in Pixar history. But yeah, nobody really knows the truth about why they didn't bring Tim back. But many felt like Disney was punishing Tim for his outspoken political beliefs. Others seemed to just be confused by the concept, and others just didn't seem to give a fuck about Lightyear. But yeah, who knows, we could flop-splain this flick for hours. Then, maybe, after realizing that you need Tim Allen to make a successful movie about a Tim Allen character, it seemed that Tim Allen was now allowed to return to the House of Mouse. If he was ever banned in the first place, nobody knows. And he brought that Christmas cheer to whoever still has a Disney Plus account. That's right, 2022 brought us the Santa Clauses. It's a TV series that follows Santa as he tries to find a replacement. And the Santa Clauses must have pulled in some decent numbers, as it has just secured a second season, proving that the world still believes in Santa and Tim Allen. Oh, oh. But even with the big screen success, we still really consider Tim Allen to be one of the greatest sitcom stars of all time, perfecting that particular art form. In a large part because of the classic home improvement, but also because of his next big sitcom, Last Man Standing, that would run for 10 years and 194 episodes. I feel like this show was home improvement, but with all the Tim Allen-ness amped up. 
to 11. Instead of three rowdy boys, he has three rambunctious girls. And instead of a television show about tools, he has a store that sells outdoor sporting goods. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Which is funny because tool men are supposed to fix things. This show did not shy away from Tim Allen's personal politics. You know, because he's one of the few out and proud conservatives in the movie making business. When you hear Tim Allen speak his political, political views, views, they really are mostly level headed and reasonable. Sometimes. He often speaks in a blunt, honest way that, uh, most of the time appeals to all political sides, most of the time mostly. Nothing too offensive or shocking, just old school jokes that modern ears have not heard since, well, Home Improvement. And I think that's why his show Last Man Standing was so gosh darn successful. Even surviving being cancelled by ABC and being picked up by Fox after passionate fans petitioned for a renewal. Many believed that Last Man Standing was given the boot by ABC because of Tim Allen's outspoken politics. Because the show was freaking killing it in the ratings. Why would you cancel such a successful show if it wasn't personal? I don't know. I'm just saying. I don't know. Who knows? And Last Man Standing proved to be the Last Man Standing when it had another successful run on Fox. <laughs> Last Man Standing. This man who represents more power in a bygone era of men being men doing manly things with some views that aren't often represented in Hollywood. And that was very much by design because Tim Allen is the type of person who is not often represented in Hollywood. And often he shows that those types of men are often genuinely good people who love and respect their families. Whether it's his family on the TV screen, his family on the movie screen, or his real-life family, Tim Allen is the ultimate family man who just enjoys a nice power tool with some more power. <laughs> Even naming his 2022 History Channel show with his pal Richard Karn, you know, Al, more power as they discuss the history of tools. It's like tool time in real life, but with a history twist. And when Tim Allen's not working, he's often involved in many charities that help the homeless. So yeah, nobody should give a fuck about what the fuck happened to Tim Allen, because he's doing just fine. Merry Christmas.